stealing a music stand from somebody. I hope I put it back before whoever needs it needs it. You know, I, I love the grace notes. They're so much fun. But you know, when I, while I was sitting while I was sitting at the front row watching them, I I was watching the people. Uh, turning the pages of the music as they were going. I was thinking, how do they decide which one turns the page? (laughs) What? Flip a coin, flip a coin. I was thinking, flip a coin, draw straws. (laughs) Who gets stuck with that? Okay. (laughs) Well, so our series this uh, this month has been Kickstart. The idea is you want to kickstart your spiritual life in the new year. And ever since we first came up with the name of the series, all I've been able to think about is car races. You know, you've got the, the checkered flag pattern on the background up there that kind of informed our, our graphic design a little bit. But that's what I've been thinking about from the start. And, and I'm not even really into car racing. Hope I don't offend anybody saying that. But, you know, I've never been into NASCAR, even uh, growing up in Indiana. I've never really been into the Indy 500. But that's what pops into my mind. When I hear kickstart, the image that pops into my mind are the cars lined up at the finish line, the motors roaring, firing up, the drivers all tensed up, hands tied on the wheel, ready to go. And all they've got on their mind is that finish line and the prize that comes with it. Now that's determination. Nothing's going to get in their way of get, reaching that finish line and getting that prize. And, and, and that, that's what, what I want to talk about this morning, having your eyes on the prize, just like one of those racers. And that kind of determination is even more important when more is at stake than a trophy. I, my parents tell a, a kind of a f- funny story. They were both, uh, years ago, they were first responders. Mom was an EMT, dad was a sheriff's deputy in a small rural uh, county in southern Indiana, and, uh, and they were on a run. They got called out on a run. There was something going on out in the country, and, and dad was driving the ambulance, and mom was riding along. And I should tell you before I, before I get too far that the person they were going out to help was okay, because the real story is what happened on the way to see that person. They came to the, because this this person they were, this run they were called out to, it was out in the country, and so they turned on this road that they'd probably never been down, and my dad grew up down there, so those, those types of roads were pretty rare. And they came to a place where the road was completely covered in chickens. (laughs) There was no way around the chickens, and he wasn't going to take an ambulance off-roading, so so he, he nudged right up to him, had the, the sirens going and the lights going, and the chickens weren't budging. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing was happening. Well, they, for all they knew, the, the person they were going to see, that it was life and death. It, you know, like I said, they ended up being okay, but for all Dad knew, somebody's life was at stake. So he started inching forward, and when the front of the ambulance would nudge the chicken, well, then move out of the way. And so here they're going inch by inch through this, this uh, mess of chickens. They're getting off to the side. They're getting off to the side. And my dad, bless his heart, isn't known for his patience. <laughs> so I think some chickens probably lost their lives that day. But, but somebody's life might have been at stake. And, and, and when, it's, when something serious is at stake, we shouldn't let anything, not even delicious poultry, Break our determination to reach whatever that important goal is. If it's important, nothing that is of less importance should hold us back. And in the passage for today uh, from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, that's the point I think he's trying to make. And here he is, as we've said uh, a lot this month, chained to a Roman soldier, punished for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, punished, chained for, for speaking publicly about Jesus, and he's just finished naming some things that used to be important to him. 
his, his ancestry, his bloodline, his uh, membership in an elite religious club, his reputation. All of those things used to be important to him. But then in this passage in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 14, he says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them, referring to those things he used to value, garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that righteousness which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So, what was important to Paul doesn't matter anymore. What's more important to him is the blessing that God wants to give him. That's the prize he's talking about. There is something that, that God, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, wants to give his people. And that, to Paul, is worth more than any of that stuff he used to value, more than his reputation, more than his elite status in society, more than his fancy pedigree. All of that is not as important as this prize, this blessing that God wants to give his people. Jesus talked about how precious these promises of God are. He told a few stories, a few parables, describing how valuable the kingdom of God is, the kingdom of God, including these promises that Paul is talking about. He, he, Jesus told a story about a man who finds a, a, a treasure buried in a field. And this treasure is so valuable that he reburies it, goes, buys the, sells everything he has, buys the field just so he can have that treasure buried there. That is how valuable the promises of God are, that they're worth giving up everything for. Now, Paul specifically names two things, two of the greatest blessings that the gospel promises. The righteousness that comes from faith and the resurrection of the dead. Those are two parts of uh, two promises that come along with the gospel of Jesus Christ. One is a here and now in this life sort of blessing, and one is an eternity next life blessing. But let's take a closer look at these two things, and let's take a look first of all at the resurrection of the dead. We mentioned that in the Apostles' Creed earlier. I believe in the resurrection of the body. You see, when we hear resurrection, often we think about Jesus' resurrection. That's the one we talk about. Jesus was crucified, and Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. But did you know that that's not the only resurrection that the Bible talks about? Jesus' uh, resurrection was a preview of a resurrection that's yet to come. Paul calls Jesus the first fruits of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians because Jesus' resurrection is the first of many. We look forward to a day when Jesus comes back and will raise the dead to eternal life. That's 
a hopeful idea, is it not? We look forward to a day when death will once and for all no longer be a problem. That is where the early Christians got their courage. That's why they were able to lay down their lives, give up everything, because they knew that not even death would have a permanent victory over them. And it wasn't just Paul that talked about it. Jesus himself talked about it. You can read in John, he says things like, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. He said, a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear my voice and come out. This is why the Christian doesn't have to fear anything, not even death. This is why we can say with Paul, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Death has been the thing that human beings have feared more than anything else in history, but we Christians have a Savior who overcame death itself. So that is one of these blessings. This, that's one of these, that's part of this prize that Paul is talking about. And because of this hope in the resurrection, this hope of eternal life, we don't have to fret over the things that we give up in this life because there will be another one. And we know that because Jesus was the first fruits, the first evidence that that resurrection is coming one day. And if you struggle with believing that Jesus rose from the dead, well, let me tell you, it's one of the most attested historical events in history. If, you want, if you're a person who has to be convinced, if you're a person who has to see the evidence, I recommend The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. This uh, is a source that uh, the youth are using for, uh, to talk about why we can believe in Jesus, what the reasons are for our faith. But if you're an adult and you want to see the evidence for Jesus rising from the dead, I recommend The Case for Christ. But our belief in the resurrection is part of this price that Paul's talking about. But that's a next life kind of thing. That's an after this life sort of thing. It gives us hope, but it doesn't necessarily give us direction. It's, it's something we're looking forward to, chasing after, going towards. And it is the ultimate prize, but there is a part of the prize that is a this life thing. And that's the righteousness that comes from faith. You see, before Jesus came, people had the law that Moses gave. And it was, it was a handy tool to, fit, to, to determine right from wrong. It was. But all it did was external behavior modification. It didn't really change the heart. It didn't change who a person was on the inside. It couldn't accomplish that. You see, the battle of good and evil is mainly lost and won in the hearts of human beings. And that's why God promised through the prophet Jeremiah that one day I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. God promised that a day would come when He would write His law, when He would put right and wrong in the hearts of human beings instead of trying to alter their outward behavior only. And God fulfilled this promise when he sent the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus bridged the gap between us and the Father on the cross. He restored our broken relationship. And to mark the occasion, the Father gave us the gift of his Spirit. And it's the Spirit who teaches us, changes us from the inside out into the holy people God created us to be. A people whose moral compasses point north. Now this is a process, and God is patient with us in the meantime, but we can never get too comfortable with where we are. I've said it before and I'll say it again, God meets us where we are, but he doesn't leave us where he finds us. That is the righteousness that comes by faith. 
That is the prize that Paul presses on toward forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. He not only wants to live again in the kingdom of God when Jesus returns, he wants to live right for God now. That is the righteousness that comes from faith. And he can't accomplish it by following a set of rules, and neither can we. We have to learn from God's Spirit living within us. But here's the problem. We have obstacles that stand in our way, like speed bumps on a racetrack. It's not going to get us the prize very quickly. Jesus warned us about the reality that there are going to be things that hold us back, things that we hold on to that keep us from moving on toward the prize. He tells the story, it's known as the parable of the sower. It's about a man who scattered seeds in various places. And one of the places he scattered seed was among thorns. And as the plant tried to grow up, it was choked out by the thorns. When Jesus explained what this meant, he said, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. Two of the things that get in our way of reaching this prize of the righteousness that comes from faith are right there in that parable. On the one hand, the deceitfulness of wealth. On the other, the worries of this life. You see, we're either too afraid of the world or too in love with it. And that holds us back from reaching the prize that God wants to give us. We cling to the things in this world that give us comfort, security, and pleasure at the expense of what God wants to give us, His righteousness. You know, sometimes I dare say it, we're just too comfortable with our sin. We, God wants to get rid of the, the vices in our hearts and replace it with virtues. And speaking of vices, I, I think that our, our brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church have a handy tool for talking about this subject. Who's heard of the seven deadly sins? Anybody? Anybody? Well, this list doesn't appear in the Bible, I should tell you that, but it is the result of centuries of Christian reflection. These are seven categories, if you can see it, I know it's tiny, seven big things that humans struggle with. And I'm just going to talk about four that I think we struggle with the most, but don't admit it. Don't admit it. Let's look first, in all, first of all at gluttony. Now, most people see the word gluttony and think overeating. Well, I think it's a little bit more than that. I would say that gluttony is overindulgence in any pleasure. Now, pleasure is not a bad thing. God invented it. But sometimes our pursuit of the things that make us happy, cheer us up, sometimes we spend so much time pursuing those things, that they take us away from the things that really matter. N namely, our relationship with God and our relationships with other people. That is what gluttony is. There's no, nothing wrong with, ha with having a fun hobby or, or doing something you enjoy or doing something that you take pleasure in, but when it is excessive, it takes you away from things that matter more takes you away from things that matter to God. And if you struggle with that, my suggestion is fasting. Temporarily giving up this thing that you find yourself overindulging in. And then you'll begin to see what it is that you're missing. Let's talk about greed then. Greed is something that moves us to pursue wealth and material possessions with an insatiable appetite. Either we find security in wealth, maybe we're afraid of not having enough, or maybe it's that we just like accumulating stuff. And what greed gets in the way of is 
putting our resources where they really should be going. The well-being of our families, the well-being of our communities, the well-being of our church. It's rough, but what God wants to do is take that away and replace it with generosity. That's the virtue God wants to put there, to quote veggie tales. If you have enough to spare, you have enough to share. Let's talk about wrath or anger. Now, when it comes down to it, anger is, can be just an emotion. It's a response to a perceived threat. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's normal. That's a normal human reaction. But it depends on the nature of the threat. Is it a threat to someone's safety or well-being? Or is it merely a threat to our own pride? Is it a threat to our own desires? Is it really a threat at all? Or are we just acting out of pride and an inflated sense of self-worth? What God wants to replace anger with is patience and peace. He wants us to be peacemakers. You see, reacting angrily just makes a situation more tense. It makes a situation more worse. But when we respond with peace and patience, we have the potential to be peacemakers. And Jesus, after all, said, blessed are the peacemakers. Lastly, I want to talk about pride. And I've already hinted at pride. At its worst, pride means thinking of ourselves as more important than others this inflated sense of self-worth, and God wants to take that and replace it with humility, recognizing that we are all equally important in the sight of God. But pride can also mean being too quick to assert our own rights, even when they are valid rights. Being too quick to defend ourselves feeds conflict. Mutual understanding Trying to understand the other person's point of view, that is what cools down conflict. You'll never get there if you're too busy defending yourself. That's why I love the prayer of St. Francis that we said in here last week. He says, seek, God, may I seek to understand more than be understood. To me, that is a representation of godly gentleness that cools conflict. And that is what God wants to replace pride with in our hearts. But none of us are there yet. Even Paul wasn't there yet. Remember what he finished that section with. He said, not that I have already obtained all this, I'm not there yet. I'm not fully righteous. I still have things that I struggle with or have already arrived at my goal. But, but, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, I'm not there yet, but I'm not going to be satisfied with where I am. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We may not yet be the kind of people God has called us to be. We're all works in progress. Let us accept the grace that God gives us when we stumble, but let us never get too comfortable where we are. Like Paul, let's forget what is behind and strain toward what is ahead. Let's let go of that baggage we're hanging on to. Let's let go of that fear of the world or that love of the world. Let us let go of those sins that we're hanging on to and strive toward the prize. Let's press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. Nothing less than the righteousness from God through the power of His Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that 
you have called us to live lives of holiness. You have called us to live lives in honor of you. Lives that bring harmony and and love to our relationships with you and with others. But even more, we thank you that you not only give us commands to follow, but you empower us to follow them, replacing the sin in our lives and the vices in our hearts with godly virtues. And God, give us the strength to let go of that that holds us back, that, that takes us, takes our eyes off the prize and pursue with all of our might the righteousness that comes from faith. And not only that, Lord, may we also find hope in the resurrection of the dead. May we keep in mind as we pursue righteousness that anything we give up in this life, even our own lives, you will return to us. God, from beginning to end, may it always be about pursuing you and what you desire for us. For what you desire for us is far better than anything we can desire for ourselves. And so increase our trust in you, that we might pursue that which matters to you. And may it also matter to us. In Jesus' name. Amen.